tonight, church. It is such an honor to be back with the nation's family. I am so honored. I am so inspired. I am so uh, challenged. I, I, I'm so blown away by what God is doing in his church across the nations. But I know this, that anytime God wants to do something in a nation, in a region, in a city, or in a state, or in multiple nations, he always looks for partnership. It always takes someone with flesh and bones. I know we like to think it's just God. It's all God. It must be just God. It's God working through human hands because that's how God has chosen to set this thing up. We can't do it without God, but God won't do it without us. Come on, somebody. And aren't you so glad that two people... Two people, Pastor Ken and Pastor Chrissy, said yes to the call of God, yes to building God's church, yes to building conferences, yes to building schools, yes to discipling people. Can we just honor them tonight? Come on, somebody. So grateful for your yes. So grateful for your faithfulness. And so grateful for your consistency and your devotion to Jesus and his people. It's an honor to be on this platform. Tonight, I want to introduce you just by way of a photograph, my, my family. Uh, we are a family of six. Never thought we'd have this many humans uh, in our household, but uh, alas, here we are. Uh, my wife, Octavia, uh, we have been married for 14 years to each other. Do we have a photo somewhere? Is it popping up somewhere? Somewhere, all right, fall from the heavens, all right, be exalted, all right, so so that is my wife, her name is Octavia, we've been married to each other, praise God, for 14 years consistently, and uh, then we have four children, my oldest, her name is Ryan, she is 11 years old, crazy, she just entered the youth ministry, my world is just, it's like worlds colliding with other worlds, after 12 years of full-time youth ministry, now my baby is in the youth ministry, I don't know what to do, so her name is Ryan. She's 11. My second born uh, girl, her name is Nora. She's eight years old. And then my one and only begotten son, his name is King, because what else would I name this boy in this sea of estrogen? Come on, somebody. And so so he's three years old, and he is the king, all right? And then and then we have, uh, you know, not to be forgotten last and definitely not least, uh, her name is Naya. She is two years old, and y'all pray for her because she's a bully. She's a, you think I'm playing, she is a bully. She hits her other siblings. She whacks King across the face with shoes, and she know what she doing. She two years old. She is well knowledgeable about what she's doing. She will look, and she will cry for a minute whenever you're correcting her, and the minute you turned around, she gives this nice little sly smile like, and we just let just we just let her be because she's two years old. Uh, but that is my family. They're back in the <clears throat> in the states right now, and uh, they have been praying for you all. And I'm just I'm so thankful for the family that God has blessed me with. It's an honor to be a father. It's an honor to be a husband, and it's an honor to be a son of the living God, but also a preacher of His Word. Come on, let's give God praise for the callings that God has placed on our lives. Come on. Tonight, I, um, I, I, want to, I want to, as a title of this message, um, I am pulling a phrase that is often used in, in, in pop culture, so it is not a grammatical uh, error. I do understand that the correct uh, sort of pronunciation and the correct grammar would be built differently, but, but, but I want to I use this phrase because it perfectly encapsulates the, the, the spirit and, and what God wants to do, I believe, in this room tonight, and that phrase is built different. Everybody say built different. So, so this phrase that's often often used in in in, in pop culture, it's it, it's something that is oftentimes used to describe someone who does something extraordinary. It can be an athlete. It can be someone who maybe is naturally gifted and talented. And the phrase you would say is, "Man, they build different." Now, if you follow American basketball through the ages, the NBA, there is a perpetual and a continuous feud about who the 
GOAT really is, who is the greatest of all time. And there's deception in this new generation because there are some who would think, who would think, who would think that, that the greatest of all time is LeBron James. And I'm not here to correct you. I'm going to let you be in your foolishness, all right? But, but then there are those of us who are seasoned saints. Come on, somebody. We ain't new to this. We true to this. And, and we would say that Michael Jordan is the, is the GOAT. Come on, somebody. Oh, Australia know what time it is. Okay, so, 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 but Gen Z would say both of these guys, no matter who you would sort of crown as the king of all time or whatever, it would be, the, the phrase would be, man, MJ, like Michael Jordan, he, he just built different. Like, like LeBron James built different. LeBron James' son built different, different. So, so, so the idea, so you repeat it like whenever there's, you know, emphasis added, okay? So, so built different. Different. So, so if if I was in Gen Z today, and Gen Z had to describe Caleb, they would say, "Man, he built different." There was something about the way that he was wired that was a contradiction to the culture. That it was, it was the antithesis of the reigning theology, the reigning psychology, the reigning culture of the day. He was built different. Everybody say built different. So we are called, as the theme of this conference is, we want to glorify God. We want to bring him glory in the earth in all that we do. Psalm 86, 12, I will bring glory to your name forever. If we are going to glorify God to the degree that he has called us to glorify him, then we must also be built different. My assignment tonight is to preach you into a new reality by the power of the Holy Ghost and to give you a description of how God sees you. I love Jesus' high priestly prayer in the New Testament whenever he says, Father, the same glory that you and I share. This thing that's this love affair that has been going on from the foundation of the world. Matter of fact, before creation was, you and I were. And this glory that we have shared throughout the ages, he says, take that same glory, God, and you put it on them. You put it on the church, Lord Jesus. So if that is true, and if Jesus' prayer is truly being answered, and if God has every intention to answer this prayer, I believe that there is a certain light, a certain way in which God sees us. Because I believe that God wants it to be said about you, that you're built different. The life of one who has been built different because of the grace of Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus, because of the lordship of Jesus in our lives and the power of the spirit is notable. It causes others to take note. Second Corinthians chapter 4, 7 says this, but we have been given this, this treasure. We've been given this treasure in earthen vessels, this excellency of the power of God. It is not of us, but it is of him. But in earthen vessels, we carry treasure on the inside of us. Why? Because we've been built different. Now, let's go back to our main text here in Numbers. Let's give a little bit of context here. The children of Israel, they were promised some land by God. He is the owner of all land. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So God decided a long time ago to give the Israelites in this context some land because it all belongs to him. He's the owner of the whole world. So, so some of you might not know the story. So Numbers chapter 13, Moses, the great deliverer, the one who challenged Pharaoh and sang the famous song, let my people go, has been been told by God to send 12 spies into the promised land that is being inhabited by enemies to spy out the land and to bring back a report. 12 spies return after 40 days and they bring back a report. That report begins in verse 25 and they begin saying this, it is a beautiful land. It is a land that is flowing with milk 
and with honey. There's lots of people there. They're pretty strong. Some of the cities are fortified. They're strong people. Anak's descendants, Amalekites, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, all the ites, Canaanites, okay? Where I'm from in the southern part of the United States of Louisiana, I hail, uh, in the United States of America, I hail from the state of Louisiana. If you are wondering, it's where the best food is in, United, in the United States. Fight me on it. And so, so in southwest Louisiana, we have this phrase that we would use growing up because football is like, I mean, it's like church and then football, okay? High school football. And, and so, so, so there was this description whenever your high school football team would be challenging another high school football team and the guys were like really big. I mean, I'm talking like six feet, like, you know, 275, like just strapping specimen. You know, we, we would say this, these are some cornbread fed men. <laughs> Cornbread fed. These spies, as they were in the land, they were coming back. And they were like, yes, it's beautiful. And yes, there's, there's, it's flowing with milk and honey. But there are some cornbread fed enemies in the land. And then enter Caleb. Interrupts them. Basically tells them to shut up. He says, uh, let's go up and take the land. We'll overcome them. Now, up until this point, the spies really had not done anything wrong. Everybody with me on this? They were asked to give a report. The spies at this time, they did not speak any lies. They were not making up stories. Up till this point, they were simply reporting what they had saw. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And as they were talking, though, uh, they were describing what they saw on their reconnaissance mission. The facts were all accurate. It was all factual, but there was something in their voices that bothered Caleb, that provoked Caleb to interrupt them. So Numbers chapter 13, verse 30 says this, but Caleb quieted the people, shut up, before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. <clears throat> Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land. It's almost as though if, 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 I, could, if I could use my prophetic imagination and we were just listening in as these spies begin to give their report and you could see Caleb standing there with them and everybody's talking and everybody's starting to chime in. Oh, it's bad. It is bad. I mean, like, it is bad, bad. Like, there's no way we could ever take these people. Something begins to rise up on the inside of Caleb and he says, excuse me, we have had enough of the facts. You have given me enough of the data. You have spoken enough statistics to me about this generation, about global evangelization, about how the world doesn't want Jesus. I've heard enough facts. I've heard enough data. But then something rises up on the inside of him and says, but we're able to overcome it because of God. Because when you are built different. There's only so much negativity. There's only so much talk glorifying the devil that you can stand to be around. There's only so much of a negative report that has zero hope that you can listen to before something rises up in you and says, but we can and we will overcome with the help of our God. God can and God will come through for us. God can and God will heal us. God can and God will deliver us. God can and God will answer our prayers that we have been seeking him over and over, asking him to pour out his spirit. God can and God will. So I want to give you some indications tonight. 
I, I, I want to give you some qualifiers because I believe that there is a marking that God wants to facilitate tonight. And I want us to be really clear about where we are. If we carry that different spirit that, 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 that was used to describe Caleb or if we are carrying some other spirit. So, so here we go, different spirit indicator number one. You challenge the status quo. You challenge the status quo. See, unlike the other ten spies, here's the reality that we are called to do. We are not called to ignore the facts. We're not called to ignore the diagnosis. We are not called to stick our heads in the sand and pretend like things are not challenging and that things are not hard and that the enemy is not working. We know well that the Bible says that the enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We realize that Ephesians 6 tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities. We know this, that our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We know these things. It's just that here for us, whenever you have carry a different spirit, you assign faith, not fear, to the facts. We have enough people who look at the facts around our lives and begin to assign faith fear and walk in a spirit of fear, which God has clearly told us, I never gave you a spirit of fear. Fear never helps you. Fear is never a useful tool in the hand of God. He does not use scare tactics. He does not use fear tactics. He has called us to walk in great and bold and audacious faith. So uh, those who walk in a different spirit you challenge the status quo and you assign faith, not fear, to the facts. Everyone's natural proclivity is to take the facts and overlay it with fear, which then produces worry and anxiety and the creation of negative scenarios that haven't even occurred in our lives. Caleb was built different. Because he carried the spirit of faith, which caused a different confession to come out of his mouth. Let me give you Bible for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of, everybody shout that next word. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. So here's the reality. Maybe my kids aren't serving God right now, but I believe, therefore I speak. Maybe I have friends, family members, and loved ones who have begun to walk away from the Lord, and you would call them prodigals, and I can see that they're a prodigal, but I believe, therefore I speak. So my reality is this. I'm not going to assign fear. I'm going to assign faith to this factual data. So I'm going to say this. The lion of the tribe of Judah will roar and my children and every prodigal around me will come running back to the Lord from the north, the south, the east, and the west and they will give up the sons and the daughters that belong to our God. This is just scripture. Somebody shout different spirit. He wants to anoint us with a different spirit tonight. Different spirit indicator number two, you are, you're driven by the future and not the past. You're driven by the future and not the past. You are driven and motivated by what God might do, not your mistakes that you have done in the past. And so Mark Batterson, famous author and, and, and speaker and pastor in the U.S., he says, at some point, most of us stop living out of imagination and we start living out of memory. We don't want to live that way, church. We want to live out of the imagination, a holy imagination of what God might be willing and able and planning to do for us and to do through us as his people. Lisa Bevere, dear mentor in my life, says this all the time. The attacks on your life have much more to do with who you might be in the future than who you have been in the past. 
who you might be in the future. Can you allow your mind to begin to sink in with the Holy Spirit of God and begin to imagine what it is God might have in store for you? The way in which he might be planning to use your life for his glory. We must be able to see beyond the natural and beyond the present. We are prophetic by our very design. The prophetic word of God is pumping through our veins. Therefore, we begin to believe. Therefore, we speak. Amen? It's a different Spirit, as I listened to Caleb's report, that different spirit that was on him drove him to think about the future. He's 40 at the time of this spy mission. Now, now I would assume he was thinking about their children and, and their children's children because people with a different spirit understand this, that God will never trust long-term blessing to short-term people. So, so, so Caleb, not being discouraged by what happened in the past, last time we tried this, but he's encouraged by what God might do in the future. See, it doesn't usually go well for people who are only concerned about the present. Ask Esau. Genesis chapter 25. He gave no regard to the future because he was hungry. So this man traded an entire future for a bowl of lentils. He sacrificed a generational birthright. He would more than likely double, uh, uh, more than likely a double portion of inheritance that would shape his future in order to satisfy his present physical hunger. Different spirit indicator number three. Your cravings have changed. When you carry a different spirit, your cravings have begun to change. Now the ten spies, along with the rest of the Israelites, they still long for and they crave the dysfunction of Egypt. Numbers chapter 14, 1 through 4. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into the land to fall by the sword? Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and let's go back to Egypt. What happens whenever God answers your prayers but your cravings have not changed? So you pray for healthy and holy friendships, but you crave the dysfunction of your past. You pray for discipleship, but you crave everybody just telling you you're awesome and everything's going to be okay because that's what you're used to. Oh, come on, connect group leaders. You, you, <laughs> you crave for somebody to just see me and let me do something for God. Or, or, or you pray for that and God does that, but then you crave the, 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 the self-pity and the self-loathing of, well, nobody really sees me. Come on, can we be honest? In the house of God, we have a saying around our church, Zill Church, that most of us are like the rest of us. Because the enemy's greatest tool and temptation is to cause us to believe that we're the only ones who think this way. God doesn't just want you out of Egypt. He wants Egypt out of you. Your past, your enemies, in dramatic fashion, God drowns all of the Egyptians as they are pursuing the Israelites. Why? He wanted it to forever be a picture that this is how I want to deal with your flesh. This is how I want to deal with who you were before you knew me, before you surrendered your life to me. I don't want you just kind of playing around with your past sins. I don't want you flirting around with the person that you used to be. I want that person dead so that the new you can 
can arise to full life and a free life and a whole life and the Zoe expression of life that Jesus Christ promised us. I came that you may have life and life to the full. Somebody shout different spirit. We don't allow the fear experienced. We don't allow the fear experienced where we are to forfeit the future of what could be. Why? Because our cravings have changed. Our desires have changed. Life was just so much better and easier when I lived in compromise. That's the temptation of the enemy. The fact of the matter is that's not even true because <laughs> uh, <laughs> oftentimes the enemy has a way of sort of overlaying our life outside of Christ with some sort of romanticized version of it. And, and if we're really honest, it wasn't that good without Jesus. It didn't feel as good as you think that it felt. It was not as pleasurable as you would describe it to be. Because you were outside of his will. And if we're honest, it wasn't that good. <laughs> the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> I no longer desire these things because he's changing me. I no longer am craving the attention of man. I'm no longer living for a certain amount of likes on social media or engagement with my posts. Why? Because he's changing me. I'm no longer looking for a secured identity, even in church, with relationships and people affirming me and people saying, oh, I'm so awesome. I'm no longer living for likes because I know how much I am loved. He's changing me moment by moment. He's changing me month by month he's changing me every time I step into his presence every time I crack open my Bible in the middle of the week not just at church and I engage with him he's changing me therefore from the inside out my cravings begin to change what my appetite was before it's no longer that oh I know I used to run to those things I used to run to the to, 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 to the bottom of the bottle I used to run to whatever it is you fill in the blank whatever the relational thing was He's changing me. And the evidence of a different spirit is what I desire, what I used to desire. I no longer crave that. It's a different spirit that God wants to release over us tonight so that we can reflect his glory in the full weight of what he's called us to do. I crave. I used to crave just hanging out with with people. Now I crave coming to the house of God. Now I crave serving in the house of God. Who would have ever thought? Some of you, that's your story. Who would have ever thought that I would enjoy coming to church? Who would have ever thought I would enjoy giving? Tithing? Child? What? Huh? Like, who would have ever thought? He's changing me. Where I used to think it was just me, me, me first and what I can get for me and what I can buy for me. And I'm the first person on my Christmas list. He's changing me because my cravings are changing. Why? Because he's beginning to mock me with a different spirit. Different spirit indicator number four. Your eyes are on God and not yourself. There's a revelation that occurs whenever we have a different spirit. Put that picture on the screen. An old African proverb says this. When you see a turtle on a fence post, you, on a fence post, you know one thing. He didn't get there alone. <laughs> that's you, boo-boo. <laughs> that's me. The turtle, that's us. Because some of us have forgotten who we were and where we were whenever Jesus found us. And, 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 and if we're honest, if we're honest tonight, and we really go back to that moment, and, and, and we realize, we remember, we, we reckon, oh, oh yes, I remember how empty and devoid of purpose my life was. I remember how much sin that I was carrying. I remember the shame that I was walking in. I remember the condemnation and the guilt that I would go to sleep with at night and wake up with all over again in the morning. Wash, wince, and repeat. But I remember 
what Jesus did for me and how he changed me. As a matter of a fact, if you are grateful for a God who encountered you, who saved you, who went to a cross for you, and who rose from the dead, I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and I want you to stand to your feet, and I want you to release your praise to him, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our crucified, our risen Savior, the one who was dead and now lives again, seated at the right hand of the Father with glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Numbers 13, 33 says this. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Their eyes were on their selves. Their eyes were, this wasn't even true. They were speaking on behalf of the enemy. They didn't say it. The devil didn't say it. They said it. How many of us are carrying a confession that the devil ain't even saying? But you didn't come up with a whole concocted plan of how the Lord can't, he can't come through for you. Not me. Maybe for someone else. Well, I'm just always going to struggle in this sin. I'm always going to live under the weight of this heavy sickness. I am always going to be in dysfunctional relationships. My marriage will never be quality. I'll never have. What confession are you carrying? What lie have you been speaking that the enemy didn't even generate? You generated in your own flesh. We seem like, gra we're like grasshoppers. I want the worship team to come tonight. Final different spirit indicator. Number five. You are, whenever you carry a different spirit, you're consistent over time. You're consistent over time. Oh, anybody can start. <laughs> Anybody can start. Anybody can do something for a few weeks. Anybody can pray for a few days. Anybody can labor in the place of prayer for a few hours. What I'm talking about is a consistency over time. He who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, endured, persevered. That speaks of Jesus' consistency. Whenever you have been marked with a different spirit, there's a consistency in you. Joshua chapter 14, starting at verse 7, is so powerful. It says this, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old. Sent me to spy out the land, and, and I brought him word. This is, if you can't, if you didn't catch it, this is like towards the end of Caleb's life. Ooh, I love talking to people that have walked with God for decades and decades and decades and decades. Because the years will teach you what the days will never know. So pull up a chair and listen to Paul Paul Caleb. That's what we call grandpas in the South. Paul Paul. Mama and Paul Paul. Let's listen to Paul Paul Caleb. 40 years old when Moses sent me, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever. Because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Verse 10 says, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said. These 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 
years old. <laughs> I'm still, listen to this man, I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. He said, don't get it twisted. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and for coming. So now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be, it may be, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Oh, listen to the fire in this man's bones at 85 years old, 45 years where he waited for the promises of God, where he contended for the promises of God. 45 years he held on to a word from God and it did not shake him, it did not break him, it caused him to press forward and he ended up with a testimony. I just need to prophesy to some people tonight that have been waiting on the Lord. I need to tell you he's worth the wait. I need to tell you that whenever you carry a different spirit, you model something, not just for you, but for the next generation where we wait on the Lord. And we say, man, he might come through in an extravagant way, but he's worth the way. Who am I preaching to tonight that the Lord would say, I need to put on you a similar spirit, a different spirit? Caleb, Caleb, 85 years old, long-term vision, long-term insight, long-term obedience. We got a lot of flashy obedience today. We got people popping up on different scenes and social media will have you out here thinking that people are a deep well and they are nothing more than a shallow puddle in God. An amount of followers does not mean anything in the presence of God. There's a depth that God wants to add to you. There's a weight that God wants to add to you. And that weight is added in your waiting. of God's promises still burning in his bones 45 years later my strength is today what it was back then give me another hill to charge give me because Caleb understood this as long as I have a pulse I've got a purpose I need to speak to some gray haired mothers and fathers grandparents in this house tonight I need to remind you that you still got purpose because you still got a pulse and there's a Caleb anointing that God wants to release over you in this latter season of your life because the word of the Lord to you is that your latter really will be greater than your former and that which is ahead of you is greater than what's ever been behind you I want you to receive that by faith tonight Caleb Caleb, Caleb, you know, it was Caleb and 11 others who went out to spy in the land. This is interesting to me. Shemua, that's one of the guys, his name means renowned. There's another guy, Shaphat, his name means judge. Egal, his name means redeemer. Hosea, salvation. Palti, his name means delivered. Gadiel, God is my fortune. Amiel, people of God. Guel, majesty of God. Caleb, dog like woof woof there's no there's no Hebrew like God is the God of the dogs or it's just dog woof woof but that will preach to us tonight oh that will prophesy in this place tonight because that tells me because what, what maybe you missed it there all these people 
with all their wonderful names about redeemers and judge and holy and all of these esteemed names all came back with a bad report. All came back with another spirit, not the different spirit that God that God put on Caleb. And I love this about Caleb, that he didn't come with the right name. He didn't have all, the, all of the things together. If you put his name right next to everybody else's name, he's the very one that you would have counted out. If I had told you all those names, if I had told you all those names, and I said, which one was Caleb? You, you, you pick Shaphat, you, because that's what we do. Because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And there was something in Caleb that says, call me dog if you want to. Call me dumb if you want to. Call me foolish if you want to. Call me not good enough if you want to. But there's a different spirit that I'm carrying. And whose report will I believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. Go on and stand to your feet tonight, Nations Conference. I just believe. I just believe that God wants to do a work in our hearts tonight.